Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Google Hangout on Air, the NMC Horizon Report 2013 K-12 edition, Consider, Connect, Collaborate. The NMC Horizon Report 2013 K-12 edition is a product of the New Media Consortium's Horizon Project. That's an ongoing research effort that examines emerging technologies for their potential impact on and use in teaching, learning, and creative inquiry around the globe. Many of you may know the report is a collaboration of the New Media Consortium, the Consortium for School Networking, and the International Society for Technology and Education, and is generously funded by HP. So um, one of the other technologies the Horizon Report indicates in the long term four to five years out before mainstream practice um, are virtual and remote laboratories. Um, Kimmy, I know you lead the iLabs project at Northwestern University. Um, I know you also have an HP Catalyst Academy for free online mini courses for teachers interested in learning how to use um, this network of online lab experiences. You've been doing a lot of work in this area, so tell us a little bit about your work and uh, share some of your experiences with us, please. Sure. Well, um, <clears throat> I'm really pleased to be able to join uh, the great team you've got uh, today um, on the Hangout. and. Uh, really a nice range of different ideas and technologies. You know, one of the things that we're seeing um, in education generally, and you know, Mike talked about uh, analytics and, uh, and, and Joe about the 3D printing, is a lot of the technologies are moving online and uh, moving into the cloud, so to speak. And, um, you, know, one, you know, we see a lot about uh, online courses like MOOCs kind of catching fire and uh, a lot of folks in K-12 are starting to wonder, you know, whether that um, uh, trend, if you will, is going to, you know, impact uh, what they do as well as higher ed. But one of the challenges uh, that we often uh, get asked about is, how do I do uh, laboratory science courses online? Or how do I take the advantages of personalized learning that a lot of the other digital technologies uh, the you know the software tools, uh, learning tools that you know Mike alluded to that produce data and whatnot, um, and, and how do we leverage that uh, in a in a science course um, when you know we have all of these uh, sort of laboratory kinds of experiences that are really hard to replicate online, and certainly we've seen um, a really rapid growth in the tools that are available, including simulations and models, um, certainly uh, you know uh, sort of serious games. Uh, for STEM education as well. One of the areas that, that uh, my team has been looking at is the idea of remote online labs. And what that is is to connect students to real pieces of laboratory equipment that might be sitting anywhere in the world, say at a university or a research lab, um, and thereby use the power of the web and the internet to give students access to resources that they wouldn't otherwise have available to them. And really that's kind of the core of what all of us, I think, uh, on the uh, Hangout today really are passionate about um, is bringing these uh, great new resources to kids to support their learning. And so with respect to, to remote labs, um, the idea is really moving the, the science lab into the cloud, uh, which is really kind of a weird idea for people. But, uh, you know, we've gotten used to the idea that, um, you know, we no longer need uh, our web server to actually be a computer on our desk, you know, we just sign up for a hosting service and we pay somebody to, to host our website and that's a, you know, a pretty normal experience. And so, so we've begun to connect uh, laboratory uh, equipment at universities around the world, including MIT, uh, my institution Northwestern, and University of Queensland in Australia, and um, uh, allow students through specially constructed uh, user interfaces to actually design and run experiments. So again, to Joe's earlier point, we got um, students being designers, not just consumers uh, of these experiences. So let me um, show you a little bit what, it's, uh, what it looks like, um, and I'll share um, kind of a, a screen uh, a recording of one of these experiences. Um, and uh, what you see here on screen, hopefully, is uh, what the students would experience on the left side, they get to design uh, the experimental parameters. This is going to be a Geiger counter uh, that's hosted at the University of Queensland in Australia. You'll see a bigger picture of it in a second. Um, and on the left side here where my mouse is, uh, the students actually put in different distances that they'd like to measure radiation. 
Um, they also specify how long they want the instrument to measure at. Uh, here we're going to pick three seconds. And also then how many times we want to repeat this experiment, uh, you know, again, with the idea that doing good science means doing it more than one time. On the right side, what you'll see uh, with some really quick typing, uh, since it's pre-recorded, is um, a sort of student lab journal where they have different question prompts um, like they might in a paper-based uh, experience. Um, and then they have to input all of their responses, uh, you know, uh, uh, in these, uh, in these uh, forms. And so as we continue to do that, what will happen now when we click the investigate button is that my uh, experimental design uh, gets queued up uh, in a queue over at uh, in the University of Queensland. And then the, we switch over to the live webcam view here, which hopefully you're seeing. And you can see on the left there's this tube, uh, which is the Geiger counter, which will then move up and down, sort of like you're seeing now, to uh, measure the radiation coming off of this sample of strontium-90, uh, which is certainly something that most parents wouldn't want their kids playing with in person anyway, um, and collecting the data as the student specified in their um, experimental design. You can see it moving up to that second distance now um, and collecting data. In the meantime, um, you can see on the lower left, it, it tells the student how long until their uh, experiment is done. Here it's about 50 seconds or so. And uh, then in the meantime, the student has to continue to fill in their lab journal uh, prompts, trying to think about, you know, what am I trying to find out? What does this mean for me? Um, and what kind of data do I think um, I might actually get? Um, and so there's a number of really important advantages while this finishes up. First of all is the idea of personalization. Most lab experiences are still done in a group, and we know that often only one or two kids in that group are really doing the work, and a lot of other kids are sort of along for the ride. Um, even if that's not the case, there are a lot of kids who are, are more socially reserved, uh, especially in group uh, work experiences, and, and would rather, um, you know, be able to learn um, on their own, make mistakes in private so they don't uh, sort of mess up the group's uh, experience and the group's data. And, uh, um, you know, have, have a sense that, uh, uh, you know, this is their own, their own data and their own experience. And so, um, um, again, this is, uh, you know, the kind of experience that uh, we're trying to build here um, with, uh, you know, with the remote labs. Kimmy, thanks. Interesting. I've followed your work for some time. I wasn't as uh, fully aware of some of the work you're doing in this area, and it's very interesting. Um, let me I ask you the same question I asked Joe about this benefit of failure. Um, as, as a learning path and, and tied to the virtual and remote labs. What, what, would your be, what would be your observations about that? I think that's a great question, Vicki, and, uh, you know, especially when it comes to science and engineering, um, you know, failure is a key part of the process. Uh, you, you, you learn by failing as quickly as you can uh, and then learning from those mistakes or learning from say, the data that comes back that's not what you expected or um, maybe has some problems with the data. And, and certainly when you're doing, uh, for example, 3D designs uh, and printing, there's a lot of debugging and, and, and errors that you have to go through and correct, and that's a huge part of the learning process. So um, we really like the idea, and we have some data that we've collected that shows that students, given the opportunity to use these labs at home, will repeat the lab multiple times even more than what their teacher assigned them to do uh, so that they can uh, get better and better each and every time they run it, much like scientists do in the laboratory when uh, they repeat their runs over and over again until they get a uh, really nice looking data. And I know you work a lot with teachers, Kimmy. Um, did you have any ahas in, in working with the teachers on the professional development? Had they readily embraced this or has there been a learning curve that either you predicted or would not have predicted? What, what have you experienced there? Yeah, I think there's a couple of things that um, we see that are often challenges or concerns for teachers um, as they adopt this technology. One is just, it, it's such a different concept to the idea of moving a laboratory experience out of the classroom or out of the laboratory, physical laboratory, um, and giving the, their students the freedom and flexibility to do it at home, out of school. Um, it's kind of like the flipping the classroom movement and, and uh, efforts that we've been seeing around the country and certainly teachers needed to get used to the idea of moving a lot of that classroom content out of school and then changing what they did in class. And 
So this is really sort of a flipping the laboratory kind of an idea as well for teachers, and we help them get through that. I think the second piece, and it's one that we're working right now with some funding from the National Science Foundation, is um, that we realize that the tools that we give the teachers to visualize uh, what the students are working on um, are not as powerful as the tools that we've, we've developed and given the students. And, and Mike may have similar experiences with some of the technologies that they deploy as well. The dashboards that we see for teachers to analyze uh, student data and stay on top of that are not as robust as the kind of technologies that are student facing. And so we are working now to create uh, more powerful dashboards for teachers so that they can monitor what their students are working on, who's working on it, if they've fallen behind, and also to share some um, analytics with them around um, are the students making certain kinds of mistakes with their science experiments that might warrant, um, say, an in-class conversation or uh, a small group pullout of some students. So we're, we're really pushing hard on that aspect right now. Great. And just uh, if you can have a brief um, response to this one, Kimmy, um, if you were giving one tip to schools or districts really wanting to get started, uh, what would that message be for them? I think the number one message, whether you're looking at remote labs or really um, any of the other uh, learning technologies that are out there, whether it's near term or longer term, uh, like the three to five years, is to think about the idea of personalized learning and personalization. That's what we're doing here with the remote labs experience um, and uh, certainly the analytics work. And so um, it's not really about the technology per se, because that's going to constantly uh, keep changing. Uh, we're going to see new technologies emerge all the time. But the question that educators and administrators really have to ask themselves is, does this advance uh, personalized learning uh, for my students, for my classrooms and my schools? And if it doesn't, then it's time to think hard about whether that's an appropriate technology to adopt. Great. Thank you. Very interesting. Um, the gentleman had mentioned today the Horizon Toolkit. We've talked to you about that in the prior sessions as well. Um, this is a free resource that's got templates, it's got questions, it's got activities that you can use with your stakeholders. Um, the slides that they're showing are showing a couple of um, activities excerpted from this toolkit. Um, again, these are free resources and we we hope these will help you facilitate the local conversations. If you haven't done so yet, please do go and re uh, download the report and toolkit. Kosen hopes you'll use these free resources, both the Horizon report and the toolkit that Kosen developed to accompany it uh, to help you with those local conversations.